Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the distant voice on the radio, guiding your hands. And it is time for episode 3 of my Let's Play of Ghost Runner. I don't actually have anything to say at the start of this one, so let's just dive right into the stabbing. Oh, I love murder. So this is actually as good a time as any to go over the upgrade system because I forgot to put this in at the end of the last episode, but I guess it worked out conveniently for timing. Uh, but yeah, after the first major Cyber Void sequence with a puzzle in it, you unlock the first set of upgrades. This is actually what it looks like at the end game. I think I discussed this previously, but um, there's not really a way to play through the entire game without unlocking all of this stuff when you go back to play through previous levels, but also it would be structurally really inconvenient for me to do this let's play on a fresh playthrough. So that's why I'm doing the thing of just only using upgrades as and when they become unlocked. Uh, you might notice that in the in the general UI, there's four power-ups in the bottom left. We've only unlocked one of those, so only one of them is available for me to use under my own rules, but all four of them are there because technically this isn't the whole, you know, I've finished the game uh, save file. It would actually be not a problem if the game let me have multiple save files, but it kind of locks everything at the account level, so you, if you want to start over from the beginning, you have to lose everything. Which would then mean I couldn't really do the uh, roundups at the end conveniently. Anyway, that's a little bit too much of how the sausage is made, let's actually get into what the game is. So, this is a really fun way to do an upgrade system. This grid here on the right are the slots that you can use to upgrade various different uh, abilities. And um, so at this point in the game, we've actually only got this segment of it available. And uh, every time we go to the Cyber Void and solve a puzzle, uh, through, as we go through the plot of the game, we'll unlock some more power-ups and some more space to slot them into. So you actually have to kind of play Tetris a little bit as you figure out how to fit all these things in to get all the various power-ups that you want to have. There's only a few that are actually useful to me that I want to include at the moment. There's this one, Deflection Boost, which makes blocking enemy shots with your sword much more easily. I don't know that I've actually done that on screen. I'm probably not going to shout out when I do it because it's kind of just happens casually. I don't often try and deflect shots because I'm quite bad at it, but this makes it significantly easier. Um, that's really the only one we're going to be fitting in. There's a few that can fit in, but that I don't want to use, such as Detector, which will show us collectibles, irrelevant because I've got them all. Tactical Overlay, which outlines enemies so you can see them better. I know where they all are anyway, so I won't be using that one. A lot of these are like referring to upgrades that we don't have yet, or power-ups rather, abilities, spells? I don't know what you want to call them. Blink is the only one we've unlocked, and honestly, Blink is the least useful in my opinion, and I basically never use it after I unlock uh, the second ability, Tempest, so... None of these ones can fit in with what we're using currently, and uh, the same is true of all of the rest of these. They are definitely very useful to get once we have space later, because remember, I'm not allowed to use the rest of this space. Uh, the final note is that each uncovered slot of space on the grid on the right boosts your energy regeneration rate so that you can use your special abilities faster, so you do get some benefit for leaving spaces unfilled, even if uh, you don't get the benefit of having quite as many of these. So, um, I'm probably going to use relatively simple ones as we play through the game because I can't really be bothered to faff about with it for the most part, but um, that's the one we're going to be using for the time being. Deflection boost. That's pretty much everything we need to know about that. Every time, every time I update these, so basically every time we go to the Cyber Void, I'll tell you what I'm using from that point on, but until that next point, this is the only one I'll be using. Alright, back to the actual game. Sector's main factory complex. Complex? But I find it quite simple. And yes, they do introduce a new enemy by having it blindside you when you walk through the front door. I'm in favor of that, to be clear. Hello? Jack, can you hear me? Why Jack? Right. You wouldn't know. It's a code name we used for you during the repairs. Diego said you were all jacked up when he found you and it stuck. Do you mind if I call you that? No. Yeah, I'm just sitting there quietly like, would you mind not encouraging the individuality of my autonomous murder drone? You'll give him personhood. 
quality of light in this room is really lovely, and I have no idea if it's actually going to come through on the video. Not just because my hardware doesn't quite capture how the game looks, but also because YouTube seems to be fucking up my video in some way it didn't used to. I put together some gear. Once I plug in my Atma, I'll be able to monitor the key's communications and keep you updated. Atma? Atma chip. The standard neural implant. You must have heard of them. Basically simplified versions of your own cortex interface. I'm gonna connect to your visual feed so I can guide you better. Can you grant me access? Done. And I'm in. Seeing the world from your perspective will make things much easier. There's about 10 enemy types in the game, not counting environmental hazards, and later we'll start getting combat that involve all of them, so it's going to end up pretty tense and interesting. We'll have to wait for a better moment to talk in more depth about the combat, though. So you're going up to Dharma City? Yes. Well, first you have to get through the base, and much has changed since you've been gone. There's a really nice element to the game physics, which is that you can always run on anything. Unlike a lot of games where they only have prescribed surfaces that can be- Wait a second, they're using kilograms for mass and cubic feet for volume. That's completely ridiculous, why would you ever mix metric and imperial? There is no law here anymore. Clearly. Keymaster's goons, pushing everyone around and shouting orders. You didn't obey. Some of us didn't. You had visited the base often in the past, towards the end of our time. This place became overrun with criminals. Ghost runners kept them at bay until Mara took over. If that sounds like questionably fascist rhetoric to you, then congratulations, you've identified what will be ultimately one of the ongoing themes. Anyway, to pick up what I was saying, you can run on any surface, not just the ones that are marked for platforming. The markings aren't there to show you what is interactable, the markings are there to show you what is the standard route through a particular environment. You can often find faster routes using those objects, but you can also find even faster routes by ignoring them entirely and just using level geometry. These factories, everything they produce goes straight up to Dharma City. While the Keymaster and her lackeys live in luxury, we basers work our fingers to the bone our whole lives and don't see any of it. How do you survive? When I was little, we were given basic provisions, but each year we'd get less and less. If not for the black market, we would have all starved by now. The Keymaster keeps taking while giving nothing back. So you chose to fight? Not much of a choice, really. The efficiency of Dharma City hydroponic farms dwindles. Soon, even the upper levels will suffer. Mara can't feed everyone. Even if she wanted to. Some decided to fight back. My parents, their friends, Saul. They weren't afraid to speak up against Mara and remind us that things used to be different. The resistance started because some of us remembered the time before the Keymaster. Why this title? Supposedly, she wanted to unlock our chain. Set us free. <laughs> yeah, right. Probably. You can run along the rails to skip moving platforms, by the way. There's a lot of places where you can save a few seconds off of your high score time. Strange. The keys are nearly gone. Not regrouping at the usual location. They're just retreating. Returning to the city? Not returning. Leaving. Most of the keys are local and never go up there. This is unusual. Mara never retreat. If she's withdrawing her forces, it's only because she has another way to stop us. What way? If I could read her mind, I would still be running things around here. If you hit the right cycle, you can actually get through here without stopping once, bouncing from platform to platform. But I'll admit, this one actually is a factory complex. Anyway, I really respect the decision not to lock you to planned routes or interactable objects. It brings a real sense of physical verisimilitude to the world. And it lets you make a number go up. Hmm, I might need to boost the game dialogue audio a little bit. I didn't factor in how much machine noise there is, I have no idea how much of the plot you've actually heard in this episode. Anyway, some of my favourite parts of this game are when it just gives you a big room with several possible pre-planned routes and a whole bunch of incidental junk you can ricochet off of in order to make your own routes. But the fact that there are so many enemy types and that they're all fully capable of moving around and they can shoot at you any time they can see you means that it never quite feels prescribed. If you take a different route, they'll shoot at you at different times because they'll see you at different times. You can even sneak up on them. So it always retains this organic air. 
I think Ghost Runner is at its best when you are improvising your way through one of these spaces. Although it is still fun once you've figured out your favourite route and are just optimising. Heading towards Amita Station. Getting to the elevators is gonna be tricky. Wait. What? Some of their units just changed course. They're... Coming back? Not exactly. Give me a minute. The climbers were always out of their depth, even at full force. Why you believe she can be a help is beyond me. She wants to fight. It takes more than that to be useful. Jack, I've intercepted the key's orders. They're planning to shut down the sector's air filters. What will that do? Toxic dust from the outside will seep inside the tower. Thousands of innocent civilians will die. The entire fifth sector. Which way to the filters? <sighs> Thank you. This is a mistake. You don't have time to worry about one sector's dwindling population. You want them to die? You're missing the bigger picture here. Sometimes sacrifices are necessary for the greater good. Well, it is true that sacrifices are sometimes necessary. It's always incredibly important to ask, who's saying the sacrifice needs to be made? Why are they saying it? And who is deciding who gets sacrificed? As we all know, it's very important to implicitly trust the voices in your head. One thing I think is interesting is that Ghost Runner clearly made a place for itself in my heart very easily. I would guess by the other leaderboard scores that most people who've played through this game get invested in the kind of Dark Souls style moment to moment hardcore game grind. Because on your first time through any given level of this game, you die and you die and you die and you die and you die. But even on just your second attempt, you can cut that down by like 90%. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that made me really enjoy the score chasing in this game was the realization the second time I played it through that now that I had earned my muscle memory, it was so much easier. And it went from being a game where, like Dark Souls, a lot of the joy was in hurling myself against this immense challenge until I could beaten and bloody rise above it, to something almost more casual, like a score attack arcade game. I would be willing to bet that any of these people with 50 deaths on this level, if they just played through it again, even if they only completed the level once before, they could cut that down easily to, you know, 10 or less. And I wonder if it's just that other people didn't find it catching their attention so strongly, or if it's just that simply a lot of people will play through a game once and be done with it. Everybody's got a lot of time constraints nowadays. Totally unrelatedly, I find myself really enjoying the music in this game. Uh, I think I've mentioned this previously, but I don't get often get to shout it out because, you know, I'm too busy hacking heads into exactly perfectly equal thirds. But I think the music really perfectly gels with the action in almost every level. Every level has its own soundtrack, and every level has its own kind of beat to the action. You don't actually have to play by matching the rhythm of the music, but I find myself tapping my foot in my chair as I play through a level. I find myself feeling sword strikes hit on the rhythm. It's pretty funny to have been feeling this way while replaying this game over the past couple of weeks, and then pick up and start playing Hi-Fi Rush literally yesterday, a game which has that as an explicit mechanic. They're just really good, you know, synthwave tracks in their own right, most of them. Although many of them are like more kind of techno influenced and like electronic music is a kind of like infinitely fractal hellscape of incestuous micro genres that are and aren't other things. So it's kind of pointless to try and taxonomize the music, but regardless, I like it a lot. Anyway, it's time to dive into the collectible zone. So in this level's collectible zone roundup, uh, I'm just going to zip right through them because normally this is a good opportunity for me to expound on some ideas I'm having about the game. But I've just done that for like two minutes while staring at the leaderboard at the end of the level, so I'm just going to dive right in. This is actually a pretty, uh, pretty filled level. There's three artifacts for us to look at and a new sword. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to dive right into these rather than rambling for forever. Chikara 4 Implant The Chikara line implants were intended to aid the physical workers of the base level in their everyday labour, boosting their strength and stamina. Unfortunately, the production costs turned out to be too high. One interesting detail that I've only just noticed literally just now as I'm editing this is that I think this is the same model of arm as was used to replace the Ghost Runner's left arm, since you were... Uh, get messed up in the opening cinematic 20 years ago and lose one of your arms and the climbers repair you with junk that they happen to have, so I'm pretty sure that's what this is. That's a really neat little detail that I'd never noticed before. 
Chikara can mean strength or capability in Japanese, so this is kind of a kind of an extremely blunt use of uh, use of language here. I think if you have to use gratuitous Japanese in your cyberpunk game, you may as well pick directly the appropriate word for a thing that increases your strength and abilities. The Climber's Token Medallions like this one were being used by the Climber's gang to discreetly identify allies. For years they had been cautiously building a resistance network, gradually growing in strength and numbers. I don't got much to say about that one. It is a nice detail that it's clearly scuffed and battered. Seems unwise though to have a physical identifier that the authorities might catch you with. But what do I know? I'm not a downtrodden... a downtrodden underclass. Hmm. <laughs> anyway. Shank. The single most popular drug in the base district. It comes in a variety of formulas as suppliers compete with each other trying to deliver the best experience with the cheapest ingredients while not killing the customer. I don't have a lot to say about this one beyond that, you know, there's potentially some questionable associations. We frame we frame the usage of drugs or the abuse of drugs as being an element of kind of like the under underside of society, but very often that's used as simply a kind of ontological thing unto itself, as kind of just a signifier of amorphous criminal evilness, rather than it being a symptom of the inequality of that society and the desire of the people in it to escape from it. However, this is just a really lovingly le rendered 3D model. I can't tell, actually, if it's a photograph, a 3D model, or a painting. Whatever it is, it's absolutely gorgeous. The scuffs on the metal, the reflectivity, it's stunning. I think it might actually be a digital painting, but like, it's really hard to tell. Next up, the sword. Today we've unlocked the Sentinel, which is... Well, I don't really have anything to say about it. It's got a kind of a green camo pattern to it and a little a little hook to hook it onto things, which is just a nice thing to have when you are a the when you are a member of the semi-secret cyber secret police running around assassinating rebels. As I said before, there's basically two formats for swords. There are the katanas and there are these uh, sarugis. But it's hard to tell if they're different models or if they're sort of modified from the same base model. I don't suppose it really matters. I just thought that was curious to think about. Anyway, that's going to be it from me for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you join me again next time when we will be diving into the next level. Breathe in. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream on Twitch and I now have a Discord server for stream scheduling. You can contribute to my existence on Ko-fi or Patreon and all of those links are in the video description. Thanks so much for watching.